Hello, my name is W. Bruce Devalier, and I would just say thank you very much for coming. I see from the turnout there's a great deal of interest in the matters we're here to discuss. <clears throat> Lloyd, thank you for the introduction. I will note that at the National Press Club and in many parts of the country, in, Niger in uh, Washington, D.C., I'm considered a Nigerian legal expert. However, in the House of Ukwu, I am a Floridian. <laughs> so. I do not profess to be a Nigerian expert, that is something, a Nigerian law expert, that is something that has been assigned to me. I'm not here today to tell anyone what to do or to suggest anything other than what is right and what should be done and what the international community and the United States would like to see done. This is a gross miscarriage of justice. It is one that is shocking. It is astounding. It is one that I don't think anyone would differ on. How possibly could this have happened? Just by way of background, I know most people in the room know about this, but some people that may be watching this may not know. This case arises from the decision of the Supreme Court of Nigeria rendered on January 14, 2020. The Supreme Court of Nigeria is like the United States Supreme Court in that it is what is called the apex court. It is at the very top. Nigeria, um, the, the style of the case, the name of the case is Senator Hope Uzodima, the petitioner, versus the Right Honor Honorable Governor Emeka Ihedioha a name that I have learned. And uh, Mr. Ihe Dioha is a remarkable politician and a remarkable man. He was elected. He was elected in March of 2019. He took office in May of 2019 and has served in Oweri at the governor's mansion in Imo with great distinction, with international distinction and, frankly, international acclaim, sub-Saharan and, and continent-wise. His election was approved by the... Uh, the INEC, which is the Independent National Election Commission, which is set up in Nigeria to administer elections, to make sure or try to make sure that the elections are fair. And that was as a result of the 2010 Electoral Commission Act. Now, INEC is an executive body. It's an agency. It enforces the law. INEC's job is to monitor elections, to oversee them, and to make sure they're fair. INEC has the responsibility of determining whether or not someone is properly elected. INEC approved this election. They approved that uh, the winner was, was, was Mr. E. Hey Dioha by a substantial margin. The second place finisher was a Mr. Uche Nuoso. Mr. E. Hey Dioha had 273,404 votes. Now, these numbers are all going to whiz past you, but at some point in time, we're going to try to make them meaningful, to put some meaning in life into them. The second place finisher was, uh, as I said, Mr. Nwosu, and he's with the Action Alliance Party. He is the governor's, the former governor's son-in-law. He had 190,364 votes. Third place finisher was a gentleman by the name of Ifiani Ararumi. He's with the All People's Grand Alliance, and he had 114,676 votes. The fourth place finisher was a gentleman by the name of Senator Hope Uzodima, who has been declared the winner. Mr. Uzodima is a very interesting fellow. Mr. Uzodima was the aide-de-camp and the first associate of a gentleman that was put in prison for the rest of his life for a 419 fraud. That raises a few eyebrows here in the United States because that gentleman was placed in prison for defrauding a German investor. A very, very notorious story. It was one of the stories that I think broke open the 419 fraud that Nigeria is still trying to live down. So he came in fourth. What happened was he filed an objection. He is a member of the APC party, the All People's Congress. APC runs Nigeria now. Mr. Bahari is APC. Pretty much all the Supreme Court justices now are APC members, and they are the primary uh, majority party in the National Assembly. The, uh, the Congress, if you will, of Nigeria. So they filed an appeal. INEC said no. Then they have something called the Election Petition Tribunal set up in Nigeria to basically look over whether or not uh, INEC did what they were supposed to do. It, I think you could probably say it's a lot like an administrative law uh, uh, tribunal where they just, they look and they see and they say, okay, this looks fair. They, once again, confirmed Mr. E. Hey Dioha as the winner and the election results with Mr. Uh, Uzodima finishing fourth. And then it went to court. And the, uh, the court determined that that was correct. That's how it happened. 
There were 388 polling units, and in Nigeria, those are polling places sort of like here. I think they're a little smaller than we have in the United States, and they tend to be perhaps in, in smaller villages. They might be a table or two, but the one thing you have to remember, they're not self-help polling places. There's somebody there. Somebody's watching. Somebody's making sure it's done correctly, and that somebody has been and is INEC. Because of the statute, the National Assembly said, we're going to create a law to create INEC. INEC is going to be an executive branch. They're going to make sure that the law is, is, is affected. So you have the executive branch creating INEC, and you have, I mean, excuse me, that is INEC, and you have the legislative branch, the National Assembly, that created them. So now you have the court coming in. So you have all three branches, and this is important to keep in mind because Nigeria's constitution, like the United States, strives to, ah, thank you, strives to, to have a balance of power because the seat of tyranny, as they recognize, as we recognize here in the United States, is when one branch takes over another. The appeal was taken to the Nigerian Supreme Court. And on January 14th of 2020, the hand-picked seven-member panel, all of them hand-picked, all of them, I believe, members of the All People's Congress, decided... All progressive. All, all progressive Congress, excuse me. It's not the All People's Congress. All progressive Congress. I think the All People's Congress was a very old one from the 60s that I'm remembering. Um, anyway, the All Progressive Congress, hand-picked members, said no. They, didn't just, they were asked to decide whether the election was valid. That's what Uzo Dima's petition asks, is we think this un election was unfair. Anik said it was fair. The election tr petition tribunal said it's fair. Everybody said it was fair. But the Nigerian Supreme Court did something different. They didn't decide whether it was fair. They decided who won. They decided that these 388 polling units in question that INEC had conclusively determined in writing, under oath, pursuant to the law of Nigeria, pursuant to the Nigerian constitution, that voting did not take place in these 388 polling units. They were either canceled or they just simply didn't exist. They weren't even real polling units. The Nigerian Supreme Court said, no, we're going to pay attention to this guy who's bringing them before us that doesn't work for INEC. His name is Rabu Hussein. He's a deputy commissioner of police. One thing you have to know about Nigeria is Nigeria is a very tribal place. There are ethnicities. There are, there are places that have been historic places where people have lived, and they identify whether they're Igbo, uh, Yoruba, uh, Ijo, Ibibio. I submit to you that Rabbi Hussein was not an indigene. He was not from Imo. He was from somewhere else. He was from the stronghold of power, the north. Now, in Nigeria, you have a national police force. That's the army. The army in Nigeria, I, someone sent me a joke this morning, early this morning. They said, what a country Nigeria is. The army sits and watches elections while farmers battle terrorists. And that is true. That is true. So he brings these votes. And he swears in front of God and everybody that he saw these votes being cast in these 388 disparate polling places on this single day of voting. They believed him, which I find astounding. The more astounding thing is the Nigerian Supreme Court then proceeded in its order to determine that Uruzima won, and they assigned a number of votes he received. And the fascinating and astounding thing, I used to be involved in math and science. I used to be a nuclear engineer, and I'm pretty good at math. But I'm not as good as the Nigerian Supreme Court. <laughs> because what they did is somehow manufactured 129,340 more votes than there are registered voters. Now let that sink in for a minute, because as you know about elections, there's registered voters. You go and you register when you're 18 after high school or when you get your driver's license. But whether you're accredited or certified as a voter is a different step. That's the next step. Do you show up at the poll? Do you have your voter card in Nigeria? In the United States, do you have your identification? Have you moved? Can you still vote? 
So the number of people that can actually legally vote is always less than the number of registered voters. And that's the way it is universally. But now in Nigeria, the number of people that actually vote are less than the number of people that exist. And that is astounding. And that's one of the reasons we're here today, because that is the facial invalidity of what we're talking about. This isn't a subtlety. I'm used to arguing to juries and to courts and trying to convince them of something that they don't want to be convinced of. Most people don't want to be there. They don't want to listen to me. They don't want to know about a contract dispute or whether someone's civil rights were abridged. But I've never had a case where it was so obvious that what I was saying was right and the, what the other side was saying was absolutely wrong, like this. It's as though I were arguing in favor of a living plaintiff, and the other side represented Napoleon Bonaparte, and were arguing that he did everything he could do yesterday to make what we said happen not happen. He's dead. He's gone. These 129,340 people that, or votes, I don't know who voted for them. Nonetheless, the uh, Nigerian Supreme Court, they bought it. And if you look at the poll, and it's floating around, here are the results. The fascinating thing about these results are only two parties voted. And in every state in Nigeria, every polling unit in Nigeria, they have somebody working there that's in favor of somebody running for that office. Now here's another one. There were 70 bona fide candidates running for office, running for the governorship of Emo. The Supreme Court believes that in this 388 disparate polling units, the people that worked for those 68 other candidates, including the people that worked for the candidate that finished second, the son-in-law of the former governor, you'd think people might like him, and the guy that finished third, nobody bothered to vote for them. Now, I'm here to say they probably need a better election campaign strategy if they can't get their own people to vote for them. If you're to believe the Nigerian Supreme Court, only people that got votes were the guy that won. Oh, and by the way, he got 98% of the vote, more than 98% of the vote. Everywhere else, he got less than 12% of the vote. And Mr. Ihe Dioha, the governor, who, by the way, when this opinion is being rendered, is sitting in Owari, governing the state of Emo for the last seven months and doing a great job. He got less than 2% of the vote in these 388 precincts. And once again, the guy that finished second, he didn't get any votes. He couldn't even get his best friend to show up and vote for him. He couldn't even get the guy he paid to show up and watch, or the 388 guys he paid to show up to vote for him. Neither could the 69 or the 68 other candidates. So it begins to reach into the theater of the absurd. This is an easy one on its face. And that's why the United States is so upset about this and the international community is so upset about this. But more importantly, the Nigerian community is upset about this. The other reason that we're here, that not only did the, the uh, Supreme Court disregard INEC, and said, no, 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 you don't know what you're doing. I'm going to be. We're going to be the new executive branch. We get to do this. It's what we call in the United States a violation of the separation of powers. You just can't do that. It's not me saying this, not a Florida guy saying this, or a Nigerian legal expert saying this. It's the Nigerian Constitution that says this. And you can't just decide how you want elections to be conducted, Supreme Court. It's not me saying this. It's the Nigerian Constitution saying this, and it's the Congress, the National Assembly, that says this. Because the rules are that not only do you have to win, you get the majority of votes, but you have to get 25% of 66% of the entire state. So Uzudima has 12% of the entire state, except for these 388 polling units. There are 3,000. Let me get my number right here. Here we are on the record. There are 3,745, no, 3,523 polling units in Emo State. Of the 388, it looks like, according to the Supreme Court, Mr. O Ozedema won. But what the Supreme Court didn't do, and let me, let me read you the law. This is what the law says. 
a candidate. This is section 179.2 of the Nigerian Constitution. It says, a candidate for an election to the office of governor of a state shall be deemed to have been duly elected where there being two or more candidates, there are 70 here, he has the highest number of votes cast at the election and he has not less than one quarter of all the votes cast in each of the le le least two thirds of all the local government areas in the state. That's in the Constitution. That's written in stone. So before the Supreme Court could validly declare the winner of this governorship, it looks like somebody talked him into or fraudulently deceived him into accepting 127,000 some odd votes, more than were cast, and an additional 260,000 votes to make him the winner. They then had to, as a matter of the Constitution mandated, that they then analyze the votes Uzodima got throughout the nation, uh, pardon me, throughout the state of Emo, and make sure he got more than 25% of more than 66% of the polling units. And they didn't do that. And why didn't they do that? They didn't do that because it's not their job. They're not supposed to be doing this. They're not INEC. They're not the executive branch. They didn't understand the law. They're not the judiciary. I mean, they're not the, the National Assembly. So that is a, a, a fatal flaw. So as we sit here today, Uzo Dima is not the duly, lawfully elected governor of Emo. Even if you believe all of these votes that couldn't have possibly happened, that were legally, logically, mathematically impossible, they still haven't applied the Nigerian Constitution to determine who won. And keep in mind, they weren't even asked to determine who won. They were just asked to determine whether the election was lawful. What they should have done was said, well, we believe there were votes in the 388, so Einek, you go back and count them, and you figure this out, because that's your job. Our job is to tell you whether you did it right, whether the law was properly applied, whether the law is proper, not to do your job. But they didn't do that. In summary, there are the following factors. That EMO has 3,523 polling units. The Supreme Court re returned Uzodema's election by 213,295 votes from these 388 polling units, out of a total number of accredited voters of 823,743. This means that the remaining 3,137 polling units, outside of the 388 that are in question, these 3,137 polling units, all together, returned only 610,448 votes. So 3,000 returned 600,000 votes, but 388, they, they returned uh, 213,000 votes. There's some serious civic duty being observed in that 388, and the rest of Emo should feel ashamed of themselves for not showing up. The reality of it is, is it's probably not likely true. But as a lawyer, I don't get to say that. I just get to present these things to you. They were all exclusively, all these votes were exclusively computed for Uzodema. You can go through there, and there were some instances where they had 700 uh, registered voters in this polling unit. 900 voted for Uzodema, and four voted for, for uh, Ihedi Oha. So, what is the reaction to this, this act of brazen fraud? And as you know, it's, it, it appears to be deceit and disenfranchisement of, of all of Nigeria. Um, a motion has been filed or will be filed with the Nigerian Supreme Court. Mr. Fine in his keynote will address those legal issues. But just giving you some highlight points, that it's obviously rendered, this, this, this order, this judgment was obviously rendered with a lack of due care, what's known in the law as per incurium. And that's a legal term, and it can range anywhere from a mistake to act of fraud. You just didn't do it right. You didn't use due care. And it's legally incorrect, and it's at variance with the Nigerian Constitution. Additionally, it's what we call ultra viris, in that they didn't have the power to do this. The Supreme Court just didn't have the power. They don't get to decide who wins an election. Just as a referee doesn't decide who wins a soccer match. He's there to referee the match. He doesn't get to say, okay, it looks like Aston Villa won three to two over Manchester United, which probably would never happen. Um, but you know what? We think Aston Villa actually scored 15 goals. We're pretty sure they did. So we're going to put this down as 15 to two 
and it's going to be a victory for Aston Villa. Now, no one saw those 15 goals, but that's just how we're going to do it. They can't do that. That's not their job. They don't play the game. They don't do the votes. They're supposed to just make the legal issues. It's also invalid for a lack of jurisdiction. The Supreme Court went beyond its charter. They were asked to decide whether the election was valid or not. They didn't do it. And finally, it appears to be as a result of deceit and fraud. This Army officer shows up with 388 results, a piece of paper, and says, yep, that's it, that's valid, you can trust me. The people that, as a matter of law, and the Constitution, and experience, have historically certified the votes, said quite the opposite. So when you have a judgment that's based on something that is obviously false, it's an invalid judgment. It's contrary to the Constitution, it's contrary to law. This court, we believe the court has the authority to correct its mis mistake. And that's what we're asking them to do. From the US perspective, from the Nigerian diaspora perspective, for the people of Nigeria, for the people of Emo State. This goes beyond Emo State, as, as can be well imagined. But we're asking them to correct the judgment because it's in clear violation of the Constitution, it's as a result of fraud or deceit on the court, and the Supreme Court is not bound by its own judgments. They'll tell you that. They have said that in pronouncements. They, they can review their prior decisions. And this is not an appeal. This is a correction. This is correction and correcting an obvious error. So I, don't, I, I think you're going to hear a lot of people in Nigeria and the Supreme Court saying, no, we can't do that. We don't appeal our appeals. This is a correction. This is correcting an obvious error. And then there's order eight of rule 16 Supreme Court rules in Nigeria that an order can be corrected or varied if it does not correctly represent the law of the facts. And that's such a case. The United States and the international community, we believe, are intent upon urging the Nigerian Supreme Court to correct its facially invalid order. It violates a great many principles of the Nigerian constitution as well as the international uh, human rights. In Nigeria as elsewhere, there needs to be a sense of confidence in the judiciary that is essential to maintaining the ordered liberty. There are three things that will ultimately unravel the fabric of a society and destroy its confidence in the courts while doing incalculable damage to the people. One, when people come to believe that judicial inefficiency and delay will drain even a just judgment or conviction of its value. Two, that people who have long been exploited in the transaction of daily life and commerce come to believe that courts cannot vindicate their legal rights from crime, corruption, physical violence, fraud, and overreaching by the government or one another. And three, that people come to believe that application of the law cannot fulfill its primary function of providing protection to the people and their families and their homes at work and in public. Judicial inefficiency and delay are assuredly one of the primary causes of decay in any nation's judiciary, and Nigeria is no exception. The surest way for society to crumble is from the rot caused by injustice and a denial of liberty, fundamental fairness, and due process of law. In jurisprudence, injustice is simply defined as a lack of fairness. Whenever justice is absent, injustice takes over. As the great American civil rights leader, Dr. Martin Luther King said, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. An unjust act breeds corruption. In fact, injustice is a form of corruption. But let me not leave you with my words or with the words of the great Dr. King. I will leave you with the words of Nigeria's own Supreme Court that I believe are fitting and apt in this matter. In the case of Adegoke Motors versus Adesanya, rendered in 1989, the great Nigerian Supreme Court Justice Oputa considered the powers of the Supreme Court as being the final in the court in the land to review its earlier decisions and said, and I quote, we are not final, not because we, we are final, not because we are infallible. Rather, we are infallible because we are final. Justice of this court are human beings capable of erring. It will certainly be short-sighted arrogance not to accept this obvious truth. It is also true that this court can do inestimable good through its wise decisions. Similarly, the court can do incalculable harm through its mistakes. When therefore it appears to learned counsel that any decision of this court has been given in per, per incurium, such counsel should have the boldness and courage to ask that such a decision be overruled. 
This court has the power to overrule itself and has done so in the past. And it gladly accepts that it is far better to admit an error than to persevere in error. And those are the words of the Nigerian Supreme Court. We are hopeful, the people of the United States, the Nigerian diaspora community, and the international community, and Nigeria itself, that these words of the Nigerian court will find resonance, and the injustice and error that has deprived Imo State of its rightfully elected governor will be reversed and set aside. As we say in the South, from my lips to God's ear, I believe Nigeria has a very similar phrase. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce my friend, my legal partner, the inestimable Bruce Fine. He, uh, as you know, he was the Associate Deputy U.S. Attorney General under Ronald Reagan. There is no greater constitutional resource or expert in this country. He is well known to Nigerians. He is well known to Nigeria. His work in the past and hopefully in the future tirelessly to assist the people of Nigeria goes without mention. And if I were to mention it, we would go on for another 15 minutes, and that's not my place here. So I, with that, I give to you Bruce Fine. And we are, um, I don't know if I formally welcomed you. This is the Nigerian Judiciary Symposium, Symposium on the Collapse of Democracy, and it's brought to you by the U.S. Council on Nigeria. At the end of our presentation, we will uh, we'll have a question and answer, and we would certainly welcome some questions. Okay? I give you Bruce Fine. <laughs> 